Turn with me in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. We're going to read the verse 6, uh, and we'll continue on today. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Verse 4. For the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every, go every garment rolled in blood will be burned as a fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. It was January 1879 in the small laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey, that Thomas Alva Edison built his first high-resistance incandescent electric light. See, that small invention changed the world. That was now a light that was intended to light homes, that then lit villages and lit cities and, and lights the world. You see, naturally in that time frame, they were driven by the light of the sun. So when it became dark at night and the sun went down, then the lights would go out. And you would bring a candle or a torch and help light it. But I don't know about you, I can't remember the last time I was leaving the house and wondered where my torch was or if I had enough light or oil in my lamp to guide the way. See, it doesn't work that way any longer because this one invention changed the landscape of society. But what happens when the lights go out? About 125 years later in LA, there was an earthquake. Now, when you say there's an earthquake, that's a common problem in Los Angeles. If anybody has lived in LA before or you visited, you'll often find friends that have their furniture bolted to the ground or bolted to a wall because earthquakes are common. However, there was an unusual earthquake at 4.31 in the morning. It's a six on the Richter scale. And normally the 911 operators are ready to receive phone calls. They're ready to receive any concern of common injury or household damage. They did not expect the phone calls they then started to receive. One operator got a phone call and said, please help us. The sky is on fire. Another operator got a phone call. Help us. There's a war that has broken out. An atomic bomb has gone off in Los Angeles and the sky is on fire. Another person called and said, aliens have invaded Los Angeles. Please, right now, send help. Send the National Guard. Right about sunrise, all the phone calls ended. And they didn't really understand. It wasn't until news reporters went to these homes with these 911 calls and found out that when the earthquake hit, all the lights went out in L.A. And for the first time, many L.A. residents saw the stars. This natural light it got exposed when the artificial light, the incandescent light, went out. See, what we don't understand is that these artificial lights, though helpful, have created a false reality of light. It's an artificial light. So this artificial light creates what's called light pollution. So that when we go to bed at night, we kind of see a haze in the night sky, but we miss the natural lights. But we all know when you go and visit Yosemite or somewhere where there's no light pollution, the darkness gets darker, but the true light shines brighter. This last year, our nation experienced a seismic earthquake. An earthquake hit our land. An unexpected event took place in March. Whether or not you believe all that's happened, an event happened and everything shifted. The lights went out in our society. The lights went out in government. Mistrust was created in government officials and World Health Organization. The lights went out on small businesses. The lights went out on many savings accounts. I know families and friends that had to drain all savings or maybe you didn't have savings and you've now gone into debt as a result of the earthquake that happened. The lights went out in families and marriages and relationships. And see, what the enemy would want us to believe is that all that we have to prepare for, the only promise we have coming is a dark, cold winter. But that's not the promise our faithful God has for us. In the 8th century BC, there was a young prophet named Isaiah. And as he walked through the land of Israel, he knew they were under a, an Assyrian oppression. And he saw the government rule that faced them. And as he was praying for his nation, he heard a voice. And this voice told him to declare to his people, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. 
And those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. See, this expression that he uses here, deep darkness, literally means, scholars say, a land as dark as death. Where death and depression and oppression is over the land. He says a light has shined. And the same message that that young prophet gave to Israel is the same message that we stand with here today. That the only light that can lead you out of the darkness that you are presently facing is Jesus. That's the only light. That's the only solution. You've been hoping for a government stimulus. You've been hoping for a bailout. The only solution is Jesus. When you face this darkness that seems overwhelming, I'm reminded of his words in John chapter 8. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Never walk in darkness. But will have the light of life. See, this concept of darkness and light, it's a common metaphor in Christianity. It's an overused metaphor, to be honest. And what happens with these truths that are profound, because of our hard-heartedness and over-familiarity, they lose their potency. And when we hear these terms like, Jesus is the light of the world, or Jesus is the only light that can lead you out of darkness, we hear that and we go, okay, tell me something new. Tell me something I haven't heard before. And the very truth that would lead us to victory, we disregard. You see, when you really think about these types of things that we faith, it really reveals how small our image of Jesus actually is. How overly familiar we've become with Jesus. Now, when you type in Jesus on a Google search or an image search, this is what comes up. Three most common images of Jesus is Jesus of the burning heart, Jesus holding a lamb, i.e. Jesus at a petting zoo. I don't know who came up with this idea. There's Jesus nurturing this little lamb. Then we have Jesus on a cross, the common image we have. But I think Kanye West said it best. Jesus is king. He's king. He's in charge. He's boss. He's the one that's running the show. And he's coming into your life to say, follow me. I will light the way. We have an image of Jesus that is too small to get us out of the darkness and trouble that we're facing. As I was praying this week and preparing, I was reminded of this worship song I heard back in my young leadership days. Written by a worship leader named Misty Edwards. It goes like this. It says, he's not a baby in a manger anymore. He's not a broken man on a cross. He didn't stay in the grave and he's not staying in heaven forever. He's alive. The title of Isaiah 9 is The Righteous and the coming king. It's about his rule. It's about his authority. It's about his power and dominion. Now, if you were to type in Isaiah 9 on a search and study it out yourself, you'll come across many Jewish scholars that will refute this passage. They'll say, hey, these Christians have gone way off the deep end. This is a fulfilled passage in Jewish history. Here's what one scholar writes. Some scholars have seen the poem as a part of a coronation ritual for a particular Judean king most commonly identified as Hezekiah in 727 BCE. Now, as a believer, as a Christian, I think this is true in some regard. I think that when Isaiah delivered this message, they absolutely believed that Hezekiah would be the fulfilled Messiah. Every time there was a significant Davidic king that would come, they were hoping that there would be significant freedom that this Messiah figure would bring about. Now, although Hezekiah has righteous acts attributed to his name, he failed to fulfill the promise. He failed miserably at the end of his life. Now, the same Bible that these Jewish scholars say was fulfilled in this passage give a very honest review of Hezekiah's life that I would say communicates that he didn't fulfill it. Second Chronicles 32. But Hezekiah did not respond according to the benefit done to him, for his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came upon him, upon Judah, and upon Jerusalem. 
See, Hezekiah fell victim to pride and led them back into captivity. There's no way that in the fifth century when they returned from Babylon and the same passages was read to them, Isaiah 9 was read to him, they would think, you know what? That was fulfilled in Hezekiah. There's no way. He left it woefully unfulfilled. The second element is this. This is something that's ignored. In Isaiah 9, 1, we have some strange references that he gives. He says this. There will be no gloom for those who were in anguish. In the former times, he brought in contempt to the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. They don't know why Isaiah would be talking about the Gentile land of Galilee. Why would he be referencing this area? This had nothing to do with the present rule and reign of the Judean king. See, now we've talked before about the specificity that the gospel writers use when they write. Now, they write very specifically. And it's not like we have today, if you've ever read a modern biography, where they go on and on in detail about the time and the scene. I I read this book, Team of Rivals, about Abraham Lincoln. And the amount of detail in that book was overwhelming. They did not have that luxury back then. As John said at the end of his gospel, we cannot contain on these papers all the stories of Jesus. All the books in the world couldn't contain those things. So what they would do is they would write very specifically. They weren't just giving random detail. Now I want you to underline that in Isaiah 9 where it says, beyond the Jordan, the Galilee of the nations. Now in Matthew's gospel, he's writing to a primarily Jewish audience. And he's telling, he's presenting the case that Jesus is the fulfilled Messiah. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Take note of this. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan. See the connection there? I, I, you know, Matthew's not just writing this happenstantly. He's, he's writing this intentionally. Then we have the great temptation after this baptism. And then coming out of this scene in Matthew 4, it says this, verse 12. Now when Jesus had heard that John had been arrested... He withdrew to where? Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. So that when he had spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then he goes on to list this prophecy. Now Jesus didn't have his Google Maps up hoping to fulfill these promises of the Messiah. He wasn't going around to random location points saying, okay, Isaiah said this, Jeremiah said this, Ezekiel said this. See, if he was just fulfilling different territorial obligations, but didn't have the power to match, it didn't matter. He was fulfilling a prophecy and a promise that came at a time that was significant. And here's Jesus fulfilling exactly what the Messiah would do. Isaiah then goes on to give him attributes. This is the other big issue that are only assigned to Yahweh. Now, you'll hear them debate this and say, well, this is a common practice for Egyptian pharaohs where they would sign the names of the gods. Um, It goes with the very first statement that they say there. Yeah, Egyptian pharaohs. When do we ever see Israel copying other nations' coronation practices? It doesn't happen. He says and declares... Behold, one is coming, for a child has been born for us. A son is given to us. Underline, here's just another little thing there. That word given is synonymous with the word sacrificed. Already in this prophecy is this idea of Yahweh handing over a son that will be sacrificed, i.e. given to the nations. For upon him, authority, the government, rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. These are all significant attributes of Yahweh that lead that the Messiah was not going to be fulfilled in some weak and feeble human leadership model. It had to be one that was different. God took on flesh. He took on this feeble, weak earth suit to become the one that would lead us back to redemption. 
Now, this word in your Bible might say authority or government. It depends on your translation. Now, I, I think it's actually more honestly translated dominion. And so what we have here is when you translate this in raw Hebrew, it means dominion or domination. And it says the government shall be upon his shoulders. I've prayed this passage many times, praying for our own government. Jesus, take authority in our nation. But here's what I believe this is pointing to. See, the government or the yoke will be upon his shoulders. The dominion will be upon his shoulders. It's implying that the same authority that Adam forfeited in the garden, this Messiah is taking back up as his garment. He's taking dominion. So you remember Genesis 1 and 2, Yahweh gives dominion to Adam that he forfeits at the fall. This one will take authority and dominion back. Jesus is the only one that can lead us out of the darkness that we're bound in. He's the only one that can lead us out of the fall that we faced. And he has authority to do it. He has dominion and power to do it. Verse 4, and it goes back a couple verses. Because of this authority, it says he has power. For the yoke of their burden, the bar across their shoulder, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as in the day of Midian. For their boots of the trampling warriors, the garments rolled in blood will be burned for the fire. Because he has dominion, he's able to break the yoke of your oppressor. Here's two pictures just of an old yoke that might have been used in the Assyrian enslavement. And a rod that they would beat them with. He says, I've snapped these. I've broken these. And dominion and authority is in my hands. It's on my shoulders. Secondly, he's removed the yoke and taken it upon himself. See, many of us, throughout this last year, you've been burdened. And you've taken on more burdens than you should bear. We always read, you know, is it Galatians 6? We talks about bears, bearing one another's burdens. Or Colossians 6, bearing again one another's burdens. The chief burden bearer is Jesus, not you. It is Jesus. He is the one that has the authority to carry the burden and pressure that you're facing. And I've seen so many friends overwhelmed. They're broken in this season. I've, we talked about this. I had a great conversation with a friend this week. And they were talking about the shutdowns back in March. And he said, you know, back then we thought one out of ten of those in our congregation would pass away from the virus that we're facing. And I got asked a very serious question back in March. Are you comfortable meeting that if out of every hundred people that attend your church, you have to do 10 funerals? I said, that's not appropriate. No. Not if we have power to stop that. And now we know that the virus has a different mortality rate. That the deaths that we're facing are not as severe as we thought then. And we are facing the right to, to worship in person and publicly. And we're going to do the best we can to have a safe environment for our community. But it's our community first that we're concerned about. But as I was talking to my friend, I said, you know, what I have seen is, although the mortality rate wasn't as severe as we thought, I have seen one out of 10 spiritual deaths since March. I've seen those one out of 10 marriages fail. I've seen those one out of 10 households go into debt that were not there before. I've seen those one out of 10 families go back into addiction. That's not okay. It's not right. And today, what you're facing will not be alleviated by some sweet sermon. Only Jesus is the one that can break the yoke of the oppressor. And you're standing here today, and you're watching online, and you're at home, and, and you think no one sees you. No one feels what you're feeling. No one goes through what you go through. And I understand, we don't, but he does. He sees you. He hears you. And he's saying, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will you hand that yoke of oppression over to him? Will you hand the yoke of your sickness over to him? And I don't know the outcome. I pray for a miracle. I don't know if the miracle is you being with him tomorrow. But right now you have to make a decision. Will you allow him to be your Lord? Will you allow him to be your king? Will you allow him to be light in the midst of darkness? Tomorrow is promised to no one. Not one. You think, man, he's intense. It's Christmas. It's an intense time. And the last thing we need is another artificial light to come into our life. For us to turn on the Christmas lights and hope all the problems go away. 
It creates a false image of reality for our kids. Nothing against Christmas. Don't, don't think I'm going there. But this year, the false lights got exposed. Don't plug them back in. Jesus is the only true light. He's the only one. I love the way the message puts these two verses. Acts chapter 10. You know the story of what happened in Judea. Jesus arrives from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. He's ready for action. Jesus isn't on quarantine. Jesus isn't on furlough. He's ready. He went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. You be burdened this year. You've been broken this year. You felt beaten down. He sees you and is extending his hand to help. Right now, I'm just reminded of John chapter five. You have the man that has been paralyzed for many years. He can't move his legs. And he sits at this pool called Bethesda, hoping for some myth of an angel to stir the waters. And Jesus walks up next to him and says, what do you need? He says, every year I wait for the angel to stir the waters, but no one is here to help me up. All while he's talking to the one that can bring his healing. Now we know the story. That man responded and got up and picked up his mat and he walked. He was healed. Don't be like that man that's looking for one way for Jesus to show up. He's here to help. He's here and he's speaking. I promise he will fulfill all that he's promised. Final verse here, my friend Kathy's going to share her story. Matthew 11, verse 28 in the message. Are you tired? You worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. And you'll recover your life. He's extending his hand to you saying the yoke you've been carrying is not sustainable. Allow me to be the authority. Allow me to be the one that carries that which burdens you. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy, or I love this phrase, ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly.